teach that the Bible is a theology. The Bible is a theology and that the theology of the Bible is Christology. The theology of the Bible is Christology. Because Jesus is the word of God. John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word that was God became flesh. Jesus is God who became a man. Jesus is the word that became flesh. So Jesus is God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word was God. The word was God. And the word which was God became flesh. Jesus who is God became a man and dwells among us. John chapter 1 verse 18. Brother John said in John 1 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, the monogenes, the Greek word for only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he had declared him the only begotten son. So Jesus is the only begotten son who has the exclusive rights to declare the father. So he is the Christology of the scriptures. That is the Christology or Christ being known is God being known. Christ being known is God being known. So if the Bible is a theology, the knowing Christ is knowing God. In the book of John chapter 14 verse number 9. Jesus speaking to the disciples said to them. Have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the father. And now sayest thou then show us the father. So Jesus is the father manifest. In John chapter 10 verse 30. Jesus speaking to the Jews said to them. I and father are one. I and Father are one. We said therefore, in going further, just like in every course of study, we now say, well, then who is Jesus? He is the Christ. Who is the Christ? The Hebrew calls him the Messiah. The Greek calls him the Sota. The Sota. S-O-T-E-R. The Sota is one who conquers a territory and governs the territory. So he is a sota. He is a savior. And if they tell you, you know, uh, tell us one primary work of Jesus, you will say he is Christ. The word Christ means the savior. So that means in knowing who the Christ is, I will study salvation. The study of soteriology. I will study salvation. So in knowing God, I find out the Christ. In knowing Christ, I find out the work of salvation. In knowing Christ, I find out the work of salvation. Now, how is the work of salvation made real to us? We said it's by his spirit. His spirit is the proof of what he has done. What he has done in our hearts. Romans chapter 5 verse number 5. And hope, make it not ashamed because... The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. So the Holy Ghost is the seal of this salvation that the Sutta has provided. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So if they ask you what did Jesus give us when he rose from the dead? A simple statement will do. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit therefore brings to reality all that Christ has done in our lives. The Holy Spirit brings into reality all that Christ has done in our lives. So therefore, to know the essence, the essentials of salvation, we will need to look at the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit and the work 
the work and the work of the spirit. We said that is what we call pneumatology. Pneumatology. P-N-U-E-M-A T-O-L-O-G-Y Pneumatology So the Bible is a theology In the theology of the Bible The Bible explains God in Christ In the theology of the Bible The Bible explains God in Christ Which is Christology In knowing Christ The Bible explains Christ as Savior Which is Soteriology In knowing the reality of this We look at the gift of his spirit which is pneumatology and then we look at the practice of pneumatology the practice is what we call ecclesiology that is the church our coming together as the body of christ and then our functions in the world we said the word church was used by the jews as a congregation a congregation of israel when they came out of egypt it is called ecclesia the church ecclesia then we break down ecclesia as a people chosen out of another set of people a people that are called out chosen out of another set of people who make laws and are given certain privileges and responsibilities so we said when we bring all that together we are a nation out of nation a people out of a people a called out once from darkness into his marvelous light so we are called out we are a congregation we are a family we also have privileges just like the greek explanation of the church and the responsibilities so the church therefore becomes how god through and in us through and in us functions in the world amongst people so theology leads us to christology christology leads us to soteriology soteriology leads us to pneumatology and the practice is ecclesiology and that is what we call the study of relationships ecclesiology is a study of relationships how this born again man now can be able to relate by the spirit is called ecclesiology and that is the core of what we are learning now remember the bible has its own way the bible has its own method birth in christ jesus on how the believer ought to relate so a bible study a bible study therefore a bible study or a successful bible study will be to expound christ from genesis to malachi that is a successful bible study to expound christ to expound christ from genesis to malachi either the sufferings of christ or the glory that will follow luke chapter 24 verse 25 then he said unto them, O fools, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets, all that the prophets have spoken. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets, to believe all that the prophets, to believe the message of the prophets have spoken. Next verse, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. John chapter 5 verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the father. There is one that accuseth you. Even Moses in whom you trust. Even Moses whom you trust beginning at moses beginning at moses and all the prophets he died harmonia or expounded in all the scriptures the things concerning himself do not think that i will accuse you to the father 
there is one that accuses you. His name is Moses, in whom you trust. So beginning from whom you trust. Beginning at Moses, he expounded. Now, back to John chapter 5 verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Next verse. For had you believed Moses, you trust him, but you didn't believe him. <laughs> you trust him, but you didn't believe him. Had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Uh. So, from this communication of Jesus, it appears that Moses wrote two things. Number one, Moses wrote accusation. Number two, Moses wrote Christ. So the minister must rightly divide the word, remove accusation trash, and give you Christ. So in the writings of Moses, we don't take everything. We only take Christ because scholars call the Bible a Christocentric material. Christocentric means it's centered on the person of Jesus. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is Christ in action. Christocentric. In the beginning, God, so the God in Genesis 1 is Christ. All things were made by him. Him who? Him the word. The word which became flesh. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him the word that became flesh was life. And the life was the light of men. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot comprehend it. So Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God. Then it was Jesus that moved in the face of darkness. Then it was Jesus that was the light that came out of darkness. So Genesis Chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3 is Christ-centered. Now, please stay with me because I'm going somewhere. So, which means it's a Christocentric scripture. So, we can rightly say that Christ created the heaven and the earth. Brother Paul lets us know that God who commanded the light out of darkness. God who commanded the light out of darkness. 4 5 2nd Corinthians 4 5 for we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus sake next verse now for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness light be and out of darkness light shone now that light brother Paul explains how many of you remember the New Testament interprets the Old Testament all right so in the Old Testament light be and the New Testament tells us that that light that was to be was the light of God that has shone in the hearts of men. So the darkness was a man without Christ. The darkness was a man without Christ. Because remember, the study of Christ is the study of God. And to study Christ, you study him within the confines of soteriology, which is salvation. Has shown in our hearts. Yeah. Has shown in our hearts. So Genesis 1, 2, Genesis 1, 1, 2, and 3 are Christocentric. The light that shone in darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. Genesis 1, 11, seed, and the seed brings forth after its kind. That seed is Jesus. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone. But when it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So Genesis 1, 11 is Jesus. Genesis 1, 1, 2, and 3 is Jesus. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The man that was to be made in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 is Jesus. Jesus is God who became a man. So let us make man. Male and female created he them in 
Christ Jesus, there is male and female. So Jesus is the man that came out of deity to save mankind. Because, because the Bible is Christocentric. That's why beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, what the things concerning himself. So what were the things concerning himself that he expounded? What I am just pointing out right now. Genesis 1.26 is Christ Jesus who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus, the image of the invisible God. Uh, Colossians 1.15 Jesus, the image of the invisible God. The New Testament interprets the Old Testament. Who is the image of the invisible God, the prototokos of every creature. The firstborn of every creature. Yeah. Jesus is the image Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 3 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person so Jesus is the image of God not Adam so Genesis 1 26 is Jesus the image of God because that was the plan that Jesus will be the man Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 3 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed you us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Next verse. According as he has chosen us in him. In him who? Jesus. When? Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So the choice of God is Jesus. The choice of God is Jesus. Jesus the exclusive express image of God. Oh yeah. The book of Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 implies that we do not see man. That when he says let them have dominion over all. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. If it was Adam that God was talking about in Genesis 1 26. When we look at Adam, Adam is not in charge. So it cannot be Adam. When we look at Adam, he's not in charge of anything. Instead, everything is in charge of Adam. So, look at the next verse. He says in verse 9, and then when we look, we couldn't find Adam in charge. Then we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of that crown with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Because Romans 5.14 calls Jesus the figure of sin that was to come. Because Jesus is the image of God. In Genesis chapter 2, we begin to see Jesus. Because beginning from Moses, beginning at Moses will be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So in this first service, I want to lay a framework that takes you from Genesis to Deuteronomy. In the second service, I will move from Deuteronomy to Malachi. And then I will open up relationships. So stay with me. Because it's critical for me to prove to you beyond every shadow of doubt that the book is Jesus' book. So that you just be hearing me saying, it is the message of Jesus. I'm wondering where and where. I'm going to show you. It's his book. I mean, look at all over Genesis chapter 1 is Jesus littered everywhere. Chapter 2, the tree of life is Jesus. Genesis chapter 2, he's the tree of life. And Adam chose death over life. Everything created for him and everything made by him and through him and for him. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. It is not good for a man to be alone. That's Christ. I will make him a help meet. Ezra. Ezra, one who rescues you from trouble. That Genesis 2.18 is not marriage. The wife is not the helpmate. The wife can rescue you from trouble. So he was talking of Jesus using marriage as a parable. Jesus is the help for man. He's the Ezra. The help meet for man. 
in the tree of life we see Christ Jesus hidden in that activity and I mean if you observe that before before the scriptures talks about Azar, I will make him a help in the previous verse he talks about the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and after that he now said I will make a help for man because man will fall and man will need help and the help for man will be Jesus All through the scriptures, 22 places, the word help me is used. It was never used for a woman. It was always used for Jesus. So in case you're a woman and you think you're the help for your husband, stop that. You are the wife. The help meet is for both the wife and the man. The wife too needs help just like the man needs help so both of them need help and the only helper for both of them is jesus i will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help my help cometh from where not from my wife from the lord my help cometh from the lord the maker of heaven and earth so Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 is Christocentric, is the scripture of Jesus. Genesis 2 18. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, Man has seen and come short of the glory of God. John 3 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. First John chapter 5 verse 12 says, And this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and that life in his, is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. Glory to God. The word life refers to a person. Hence, where you see the word life and life eternal, we're referring to the person of Jesus. Noah's ark is a reward for sin and judgment. So Noah's ark was the gospel of Jesus. He that believes the gospel entered the ark. He that rejected the gospel perished with the flood. So Noah's ark was Jesus communicated by Noah in types and shadows to his generation. Hey, 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 look at me everybody. Look at me everybody. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you know me, is the teaching ministry of Moses to Israel. Those books were the messages Moses preached to the children of Israel. Because Genesis is the promise of an Exodus. You didn't hear that. Genesis is the promise of God of an exodus. God told Abraham, your children shall be taken into bondage for 400 days. After that, I will bring them out. So Genesis contains the promise of God's exodus from darkness to light. Because in Genesis, man will fall. But in exodus, God will move man out of darkness to light. So Genesis is God's promise of an exodus. So when Moses was teaching Israel, picture yourself in the audience. Moses is now explaining to them by teaching. He began just like I started Genesis 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. He told them about the fall of man and he told them about the plan of God. Even though not in revelation, but he communicated it in types and shadows, even though they couldn't understand because it was not for them. It wasn't for them. It was for us. somebody's looking at me yeah it wasn't for them first peter chapter 1 verse 9 it wasn't for them it was for us put it up for me first peter chapter 1 verse 9 receiving the end of your faith the salvation of souls next verse of which salvation the prophets have inquired so as they were teaching you see when moses was teaching in the midst of his teaching he was making inquiries so he would teach and teach then by the spirit, he will say something he doesn't know. Then he will interrogate. But what is this? What is man? God said, let us make man. What is man? Then he can't arrive at an answer. Then David also comes in the prophetic Psalms. What is man? What? Because Moses couldn't answer what is man. So David also came up. Since Moses can't answer what is man, even though he was teaching, man became a mystery to them. Then David also inquired, what is man that thou art mindful of him? 
And David couldn't get an answer for what is man. So the writer of Hebrews showed up and he said, we looked for this man. We couldn't see him in Adam. Then when we looked well, we see Jesus. Jesus is the man that the interrogation of started from Genesis. Man is Christ. Christ the man. Christ the man. One mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. So they were interrogating. They were inquiring about the salvation plan of God. Because the book is a book of soteriology. Because soteriology reveals the work of Christology. And Christology is our theology. Outside Christology, we have no theology. Our knowledge of God is in Christ. First John 5 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and had given us an understanding that we might know him, that we might know him. The reason for the coming of Jesus is that we may know him. He couldn't stay in the invisible realm. We will never know him. So he came as a man that we may know him that is true. Or that we may know the truth about God. That we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son. Jesus Christ. Who is his son Jesus Christ? This is the true God. Who is the true God? That is eternal life. So what do you have inside you? Eternal life. What is eternal life? The true God. Who is the true God? Jesus Christ. The true God, Jesus Christ. The true God is Jesus Christ. So Noah's ark is a reward and judgment of sin. If you reject the gospel, you're condemned. If you accept the gospel, you're saved. So the ark is figurative of the long suffering of God for 120 years. While Noah kept preaching and preaching and preaching. And the people of Noah rejected the gospel. So in Genesis, that substance I just picked out for you is what you take and the rest you trash. Of course, there are other things. There are other things time will not allow me. Today I'm just giving you teasers. Go and do your own homework. <laughs> there are other teasers. Like the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph I've told you. It's not a motivational story. I know you have a dream. Uh, just keep dreaming. Uh, and don't let anybody take away your dream. Uh, just keep your dream. Uh, because your dream will become a reality for those who who dream not dare not and those who dare not do not and so you keep your dreams somewhere they may not like you for your dream but you're not the first on the list every dreamer is opposed and goes through rejection and, 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 and I feel this thing and, 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 and he goes through hatred you just keep your dream you fight for your dream I feel this thing your dream will send you to the Peter you know the Peter when you are in the Peter it may look like all hope is gone because in the Peter there is no sunlight in the Peter But just hold on. Just hold on. Just hold on. Don't give up your dream. You hold it tight. And if you hold on, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Because though the weeping may endure for the night, joy comes in the morning. After midnight is morning. You may be in your midnight hour. Don't give up. Don't give in. Morning is about to break fault uh, somebody shot money 
the word Peter is prophet in training. Peter, prophet in training. P-I-T. You may be in the Peter. Consider that's your training ground. You think we can't preach like that? <laughs> we have a more excellent way. You may be in the pit, but get ready. You're coming out of the pit, uh, but get ready uh, from the pit. Uh, the next day is the Potiphar. Uh, PP. Uh, you get to Potiphar. Uh, and in the house of Potiphar, uh, 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 you may not be celebrated, uh, but, 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 but Potiphar cannot deny uh, that God is with you. But get ready shortly after Potiphar's prison. <laughs> Potiphar prison, PPP, and you may be so angry that all the peace in your life have not brought joy. But hold on, hold on, hold on, don't give him, don't give up. I feel like somebody is about to celebrate, somebody is about to jubilate because from prison it will be palace. Somebody is about to go to the palace, somebody shall palace. Isn't that some good motivation? But that's not the gospel. What I just did was I wasted all your time. Because I said nothing. I just gave you a bunch of rubbish. You felt nice about it. You were screaming and shouting. Some of you started getting in the spirit. Uh, because I, I could see it in your eyes. Uh, you know this thing uh, is contagious. Let me get back. Let me get back. <laughs> Are you still in this building? <laughs> ah. The story of Joseph is a story of Jesus. Joseph in a house loved by his father. For God loves Jesus. My beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Rejected by his brothers. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. Sent him to pit. Jesus in hell. See? And in hell he went through trials. So in hell there was Potiphar. There was Potiphar's wife. In hell there was prison. But shortly after prison. God raised him up. He seated at the right hand. The palace. And at the right hand, just like in the palace, Joseph didn't sit alone. He sent for his brothers. His brothers came and he gave them inheritance. When Jesus rose, he raised us up together to be seated together in the heavenlies. Far above principalities and powers. I feel like somebody is getting blessed. So the story of Joseph is a story of Jesus. It's not a motivational story. Is the revelation of Jesus communicated in a parable using someone's life experiences? So when you read, don't look for Joseph, look for Jesus. Because the Bible is the book of Jesus. It's his book. In Exodus, is the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb. Exodus 12, 13. Jesus as the Passover lamb. It is that lamb that was killed and the blood put on the doorpost. And when the angel of death sees the blood, he passes over. Jesus is that lamb. Because First Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 tells us, Purge out therefore the old living, that you may be a new lump as you are unliving. For even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. So that animal in Exodus was Jesus in typology. The main gist of Exodus is the coming out of the people. And how they were brought out was by the blood on the doorpost. And Jesus is our Passover. And because of Jesus' blood, we are out of darkness into light. In Leviticus is the book of offerings. The book of offerings. 
I don't have time to exhaust Exodus. You have the tabernacle, outer court, inner court, holy of holies. Both of that tabernacle, that entire tabernacle is Jesus. Outer court, inner court, holy of holies. So all the pieces of furniture in the tabernacle were Moses' teaching ministry to reveal Jesus to Israel. He was using different things to communicate Christ. But they couldn't see Christ. They kept seeing furniture. Because as long as Moses is read, there's a veil. But when the veil shall be taken, when the veil shall be taken, when they turn to the Lord, and the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, all that is in Exodus. In Leviticus, we have the offerings, all the different types of offerings. We have the offerings, sin offering, trespass offering, several offerings. And Jesus is all of that offering in one. All the offerings they were bringing couldn't cleanse them. All the offerings they were bringing couldn't take care of them. Instead of them to see Jesus, they were bringing offerings. Moses was teaching them Jesus in offerings, but they didn't see Jesus, they saw offerings. So they missed the point. Yes, sir. But today, by one, by one offering, we don't have to bring offerings like they brought in Leviticus. Leviticus is a book of offerings, alright? Look at that, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, how many sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on, on the right hand of God, verse 14. For by one offering, how many offering? He had perfected forever. For how long? Them that are sanctified. So the book of Leviticus is the book of offerings. Numbers and Deuteronomy. Numbers and Deuteronomy. You will see there the fiery serpents. Fiery serpents came out to buy the children of Israel. And God told Moses to construct a brazen serpent. And lift it up. And all they were required to do is look and leave. When the snakes are biting them, just keep looking. Just keep looking. As long as you're looking, no snake bite will hurt you. As long as you're looking, no venom will affect you. Why? As long as your gaze is on Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Once your eyes are on Jesus, the devil and all his demons are too small to scratch you. But you know the problem is, when you see the devil and demons making noise, you leave Jesus and you keep looking at them and as long as you're looking at them they will bite you and hurt you and kill you so what to do is keep your eyes there no matter the noise they're making don't be distracted keep your eyes there as long as you're looking they can do nothing about you after a while they will abandon you and look for somebody that will open up to them just like peter said jesus if you're the one on the water ask me to come jesus said come as long as he was looking at jesus he walked on the water but when the winds and the wave became boisterous and he had the noise of wind and wave he turned on his eyes the moment he took his eyes off he sank the plan of god is for you to look at jesus but the plan of the devil is for you to remove your eyes from jesus and examine your situation beginning at moses is it getting clear he expounded unto them in all the scriptures what are those things not getting clear the things concerning himself the things concerning himself numbers 21 9 that's where you have the fiery serpents numbers 20 11, see jesus as the rock the rock that moses struck and water came out and they drank they kept drinking water and forgot the mission of the water the water was to reveal that jesus is the living water he said this water that i shall give you when you drink you will never trust again. Jesus is that water. He is that rock that followed them. He is that rock that followed them. Brother Paul talked about that rock in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. The rock that followed them. Numbers 20, 11, The rock that followed them. The numbers 11, 7 to 9. The manna. The manna. They were hungry and Moses gave them manna. The mission was not for them to eat manna. The mission was them to see Jesus as the manna. But they ate and never saw. That's why these churches are like eating communion. They never see Jesus. They only see bread and ribina. 
As long as your eyes are on the bread and ribena, you can never see Christ. You can't see two things at the same time. You can't see bread and ribena and see Christ. No, you are either seeing Christ or you're seeing bread and ribena. That was the veil. The veil that covered them in the Old Testament was the bread and ribena. And as long as your heart is on the bread and ribena, you can't see Christ. The heart must turn away from the bread and ribena to Christ. Then the veil of Moses will be taken. Then you will see bread as bread, ribena as ribena, Jesus as Jesus. If you understand me, shout, I hear you. He's a rock that followed them. He's a rock that followed them. Numbers 24, 17, he's a star. The morning and bright star. Praise God. I said praise God. Beginning at Moses. Akemosios. Akemosios. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So in the next service, look at the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. The things concerning himself. Amos 3.3 3, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Agreed means except they be appointed together. That's the way it is in the original. Except they be appointed together. That is the communication between God and the prophets. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach. Underline the word teach. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Next verse, teaching. Teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Amen. Look at that phrase. Heaven and earth. Yeah, da, da, da. Look at that phrase. Heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word heaven and earth was Moses' teaching ministry. Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth is a relationship. Heaven and earth is a relationship. Heaven and earth refers to the union between God and man. Heaven and earth refers to the union between God and man. And in Matthew 16, 13, it tells us, Jesus met them and he said unto them, Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Next verse. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Next verse. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Next verse. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. Next verse. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven, heaven and earth, my father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Next verse. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed where? In heaven. So, in other words, he talks about the church being the heaven and the earth fact of God. The church is the heaven and earth fact of God. The heaven and earth, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loose. So the church is a fact of God's heaven and earth. In other words, God's union with us that happened in the resurrection is called heaven and earth. 
God's union with us that happened upon his resurrection is called heaven and earth. Matthew 18, 15, 19, Jesus talked about uh, a, a brother that is offended. Put it up for me, Matthew 18, 15 to 19. Moreover, if the brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Don't gossip him. Just discuss it between two of you and let the matter die there. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. The reason why you gained him is because you didn't gossip him around. If you have told other people, it will be difficult to gain him because you will be embarrassed. You will be disgraced. God doesn't disgrace people. God covers people's dignity. God does not deshine. Deshining is ungodly. Go to your brother. Don't tell anybody. Go to him. Tell him, bros, I don't like this. Stop it. And he dies there. You don't take it as a gist. When you're drinking Coca-Cola with short bread. Don't take it as a gist. It dies because you're your brother. The intent for confronting him was to gain him. Now that you have gained him, the matter did not exist. That's how brethren relate. Next verse. Give me that scripture. But if you will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. Don't gossip him in the prayer group. Take one or two more. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Next verse. And if you shall neglect to hear thee, tell it unto the church. Church here doesn't mean announcement. It means tell the pastor. But if you neglect to hear the church, the authority, let him be unto thee as an hidden man and a publican next verse. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 19. And again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven. So again, where he talked about anything, you know, the reasons between you and your brother. Alright? Now, that means whatever you do amongst men which has to do with walking in love is done by God. Anything that is related to walking in love is done by God. So, heaven and earth. Remember Jesus said, our father which art in heaven. And remember I have told you before, heaven is not where you go when you die. Heaven is God's space on earth. The space of God on earth is heaven. I've given you the illustration before. The president of the United States of America flies Air Force One. Air Force One is not a particular carrier. Any vehicle that the president of the United States, Portus, walks into that vehicle becomes Air Force One. If he comes to Nigeria today and decides to fly Ibom Air, for the period he's in Ibom Air, is Air Force One. So, Air Force One is not a particular carrier. The president is Air Force One. So, wherever the president enters is Air Force One. So, heaven is not a particular location. Heaven is God's space on earth. So anywhere God is becomes heaven. And I have news for you. He lives in you. You are the heaven and earth of God. Immortality in mortality. Heaven and earth. So heaven is God's space. That is anywhere God dwells in the earth is called heaven or heavenlies. Now, do people die... And equally go to God. Yes. People die and go to God. But anywhere God is. Is referred to as heaven. It's actually an Old Testament explanation. Of where God dwells. The word heaven. Is an Old Testament explanation. Of where God dwells. The atmospheric heaven is used as a figure of speech. To explain. That. God is expansive. God is expansive. That's why the atmospheric heaven is used. To explain the fact that God is expansive. You can't lock him up in a location. 
That's why the word heaven, which is the atmosphere, is used to explain that reality called God. That God is unseen in the physical realm and he dwells within the earth. But wherever you hear our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that prayer, the father is not someone you see when you die. It's a seller point. The father is not someone you see when you die. He is someone that is already dwelling amongst men. He's not a future reality. He's a present reality. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 1, verse 23, one of the names that Jesus was referred to is God with us. Who is with us? God. What is the name? Ima, Ima, Noel. Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I will be with you always. Huh? What did he say? I am with you always till when? The end of the earth. So it's not an end of the world disposition. And I'm sure you, you know we've done all of that study. So that statement in itself, when you say that all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me, already shows you a relationship between heaven and earth. Mortality and immortality. Immortality in mortality. Heaven and earth. is a relationship. And you know we said the gospel is a relationship. Did we say that? The gospel is a relationship. The resurrection of Jesus, which is the gospel, is a relationship. It's not just a mere event. It's a relationship. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1, 3 and 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. Next verse. By which also you are saved. If you keep in memory that which I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I told you that the word raised anastasis in the Greek is not something that happened. It's a present continuous. He was raised last he is raised now. He remains raised. That is how it is in the Greek. Are you following? First Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Verse 17. And 17. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. So it's a present tense reality. Why is it a present tense reality? Because the gospel is a relationship. The gospel is about the resurrection. And the resurrection is a relationship. That's why you say, Lo, I am with you. That's the gospel. I am with you always. The gospel is a relationship. Lo, I am with you always unto the end of the earth. So the gospel, which is about the resurrection of Jesus, is a relationship. Every time I go out to preach, what I am introducing to men is a relationship that is based on the resurrection. Now, let me put it better. It is a resurrection as a relationship. Christ is raised from the dead. That's a fact. Christ is raised from the dead christ is raised together with you that's the gospel christ is raised together with you the relationship that god intends to have he displays in the resurrection and so we said that when he told them go and make disciples 
We said that salvation happens in microseconds. But discipleship is a lifetime of learning. Discipleship is a lifetime of learning. It's not the same. Teaching them the word matatheo. It means to make people students or to make people to learn. Matatheo. And you must be systematic in learning. You can't learn haphazardly. You must be systematic in learning. Even in Bible teaching, there must be a system of learning. A system of educating. And that's what I do in church all the time. I take you through a whole series because all of the teaching, I break it into segments in a systematic way. So we lay foundation, we build and build and you're wondering where are we going? You keep coming, then towards the end you see the picture of everything I started building over a period of time. Because it's systematic teaching, it's called systematic theology systematic theology and the Pauline theology is systematic it's not haphazard it's not scattered even the arrangement of the books of the Pauline theology they are systematic he begins with righteousness in Romans then he now deals with the issues of Corinth systematic it's not scattered you don't learn the Bible in a scattered way can a Christian grow without teaching no nay he a Christian cannot grow without teaching. Teaching is God's device for growing believers. So after you are born again, the next thing you should be exposed to for the rest of your life is teaching, 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 teaching. And that's what we teach. Even though this morning I taught and preached, did I? I taught, preached, and motivated. Correct, pastor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stand up, let's close. <laughs> I feel <laughs> if I was wearing a jean, I would have sat down for you. I would have done the floor style for you. I would have even laid down and just be dragging. Lift your right hands, Father. We pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this service all over the world. Thank you for the revelation of Jesus growing big in our hearts. Thank you for your word coming with life. Thank you for the relationship that we have between mortality and immortality. The amalgamation of the reality of heaven and earth, which is the fact of your resurrection. I decree and I declare that whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. Rooted out. Bodies and yokes are destroyed. Your people built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus glorified. Thank you for answered prayer. And I decree right now, sick bodies be healed. Be healed. Sick bodies be healed. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for grace. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen like thunder. Go ahead and celebrate the word with a shout. Is that a celebration or a wailing? I, I, I want some Holy Ghost. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. So when you hear beginning at Moses, you have an idea? You have an idea of beginning at Moses? What Jesus did was he went to Genesis and began to bring out the Christocentric scriptures. All of Genesis, then Exodus, all of Exodus, Leviticus, all of the Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the prophets. And when he brought out himself from every book, at the end of the day, the Bible said, then opened he their understanding, that they might understand. So their understanding was split open, dinoguo in the Greek. And then a collection of the facts together, tsunami, when they saw all the facts put together. They knew that, oh, okay. So this book is talking about Christ. Amen. Are we blessed? Grab a good offering. Let's give Jesus as we honor him. 
Let's honor what he has done. Let's honor his resurrection. Let's honor the revelation that we have access to. Let's honor the light that shines through the teaching of God's word in this house. Let's honor. Praise God. We honor God's word. We honor Christ. We honor what Christ has made available to us. All of you watching online on television, the banking details are scrolling. We give in faith. We give with joy. Through your givings, we're able to get this word to the ends of the earth. Through your giving, we're able to get this word all over the world. All over the world. All over the world. And through your giving, men are brought to the knowledge of the truth. Through your giving, people are maturing and growing. Great is your reward. I didn't hear a good amen. amen. Great is your reward. That your money has become an instrument, a tool in the hand of God to get the gospel to those for whom he died. Thank you for giving to the Lord. All our partners and friends were so excited to be able to spend this time sharing fellowship with all of you. Lift up your offerings. Let's pray. Father, we give in faith. We give with joy. And we thank you for the privilege of giving today. I ask that everybody giving online and those giving on Facebook and those giving on television, those giving on radio and everybody in the building here and in all our campuses, that our offerings and our sacrifices and our givings are a sweet smell before you today. Thank you for grace that are bound to us, your people. We have sufficiency in all things. We are bound unto every good work. Thank you for answered prayer. This week, every need is met supernaturally. In the name of Jesus, the favor of God is at work on your behalf. Opportunities open up to you. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen.